because I know this kind of ties in with your ambient smart environments mm. as well. Like, yeah, because we're talking about metacognition, like using technology to afford us metacognition. But it's like if you could measure, yeah. you know, like how well am I doing in my relationship? How often am I practicing wisdom? How much of my attention am I wasting on other stuff? Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, it seems like there is an opportunity there for like anti-meaning crisis technologies. Yeah. This ambient smart technology work is kind of reactionary against the social, the social media stuff. Yeah. I felt like I was being pessimistic for so long, and it's whenever true. I gave whenever I gave talks on that stuff, people were always like, "Oh, you know, like focusing too much yeah. on the negative." And so I kind of went away, and for the next project, I thought, you know, I just want to like really kind of be imaginative. Forget about the economic incentives, the business model stuff, forget about all of that and just think what can we, given the the picture we have of the active inference agent, what can we do into what kind of technology can we imagine? And I think we can imagine some pretty amazing technology. The aim, at least for me, is to begin to maybe carefully uncover like an archaeologist, some like principles so that we can develop maybe a principled approach to developing good technology. Um, You know, we have, um, Ben and I have a new paper out on ambient smart tech. Um, The first thing to say about it is it's different than the technology we've been talking about so far because you would own this. This wouldn't be a vicious AI owned by a corporation bending you towards, um, you know, their profit margin. This would be an AI that you own. I don't know if people at home know what an ambient smart um, environment is, but this is this is Ben's forte. I, I really think it is the opposite of the social media yeah. nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know, using, like, using AI I'm for hopeful. good. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad yeah. you said that because that's that is kind of explicitly what it was supposed to be in terms of like the work I was doing. It, it really was supposed to be just like a counterbalance to some of the previous work I'd done. And an ambient smart environment is um, it's an environment that you work backwards. So it's a, a classroom or a home or an office which is infused with smart technology, which is kind of we all, you know, smart technology is kind of learning about us and updating itself kind of automatically. Um, The ambient part is what I think is really interesting. Um, That's, I think that's where the key, the magic lies. Um, Ambient technology is just technology that functions without a kind of direct um, human machine, without, without an intentional moment of interaction or an interface. But essentially, like, computing power that's operating in the background and adapting in real time uh, to a person's needs. And um, so that's when, when we talk about ambient smart environments, that's basically what we're talking about. And most of the examples that we use um, in the papers are quite speculative examples. So I, I refer to this all the time as near-future technology because it's – it, there's there's nothing here that is kind of um, that we couldn't build in principle. It's just a question of um, you know uh, like taking the time for this to be to be to be adopted and picked up. Once you start thinking about it, you can get really really imaginative with this. So you could have a you could have a refrigerator that you kind of tell it that you want to get better at cooking, and it starts monitoring the kinds of things that you cook. It's linked up to your oven. It's hooked up to your kind of um, your grocery store account, and it's kind of learning the kinds of things you, you you tend to cook. It's maybe even using ambient sensors in the environment to watch how you cook. And then you tell it that you want to improve at a steady rate. And so it starts to just kind of turn up the uncertainty and kind of bring in ingredients that it knows that you might be unfamiliar with. And I think the thing here that's really important to recognize, and this is a key a key feature of a key claim in the paper that we just published, is I think up until now with with traditional technology, we tend to think of technology as simplifying a problem space. So technology is there to make life easier in some way for us. Mm -hmm. I think when we think about ambient smart environments, I think one thing that is like very striking is that when we think about, when we think in terms of kind of attractor states and uncertainty gradients and how that connects to affectivity and well-being in the work that Mark's done, the biggest potential here is actually to have environments that can turn up the uncertainty. Yeah, they make it harder for you. Environments, technology that is not necessarily trying to make you reduce uncertainty immediately faster. And so in the paper, we talk about shifting us towards exploratory action policies, shifting us towards epistemic affordances and epistemic actions, technology that is driving you to learn and to to learn new, new embodied skills. Um, 
and this has um, there's another paper within us Hippolyta where we talk about the the, the, ther- the potential for like genuinely therapeutic application um, because in in in, ther- in um, psychiatric research there is work where where um, psychopathology is described through the language of complex systems where say like an instance of psychopathology is a kind of a tractor base and characterized by certain symptoms. And the goal of psychotherapy and psychiatry is to disrupt those attractors. And so what you want to do is kind of turn the heat up, turn up the uncertainty, disrupt habitual patterns of, of behavior. Um, so that was that's like a, a key distinction. You can get really weird with this. So there's neuroscience research that shows, for example, the frequency of rhythm, like particular frequencies in lighting, and, and visual cues can actually entrain breathing patterns. So you can, there's research, research that shows you can influence how quickly people walk through airports by modulating the frequency of particular visual cues in the environment. And so you can imagine now kind of furniture that detects, it's hooked up to a Fitbit or something. It detects when you're stressed and anxious, and it just introduces some haptic rhythm into your chair or your sofa that entrains like a different breathing pattern um, there's research that shows that um, improved interoceptive accuracy can reduce symptoms of psychopathology so what about a room that can now essentially in kind of more or less subtle ways put you inside your own body and kind of put you more in touch with your own heart rhythms and other interoceptive processes to increase to decrease the uncertainty between uh, brain and body um, so that's been I've been that's what I've been doing recently is a lot of my time is spent just kind of fantasizing about increasingly weird ways that you can <laughs> yeah. optimize this feedback loop between the environment and and the agent. You know, I've been I've been speaking to somebody recently who works uh, has a company that builds technology for elder care settings for like care homes with people people with dementia and people who care for people with dementia. A lot of the technology around dementia care is focused on like the cognitive problem. It's like, you know, the very obvious symptoms, people like with memory issues and problems communicating. But one thing anybody who has been confronted with dementia will know is that there's a serious affective side to this as well. Mm. There's like very, there's a profoundly difficult emotional um, side to dementia where people, they experience a lot of anxiety, a lot of frustration, and they have problems communicating that. And it's very easy to think of the way that ambient technology and network devices could communicate, could help alleviate those problems in various ways. So I'm really excited about this. This is this is pretty much all I'm working on right now. And I think that the active inference framework and the connection between affectivity and uncertainty is is really useful. And the, yeah, the ways that envir- technologically infused environments could kind of tap into that and pick up some of like the predictive slack. And, 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 and really help you. We, you know, we talked about fastness and slowness before and trying to, trying to cultivate a particular topography of attractor states, um, yep. that is conducive to that flexibility that characterizes well-being. Um, it's really easy to imagine the ways that ambient environments could, could really support agents in doing that to break mm-hmm. up problematic habits or to introduce flexibility, uh, like in strategic ways. That just seems to me like the positive vision for a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Like that's the way it yeah. could go if people that actually, you know, gave a shit about other people were running it, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, and yeah. I think that's that sometimes like, the, yeah, like the next stage, because a lot of this stuff, once it's developed, it's cheaper, it's easier to use. Like it does become more common parlance. So, mm. um, yeah, I don't think it's an actually unrealistic vision to think that you could apply those things at some point. I'm just struck by how cool I think it would be if I had an AI assistant, personally owned AI assistant, who scheduled my meetings to end a little bit early on Tuesday and proposed an ingredient I've never used that needs to be cooked with a technology I haven't used yet, like a new kind of using a knife or like, you know, use an air fryer in a way that I've never used before. And then it suggests that, uh, you know, as a, as a possible menu approach. So I'm given a little bit more time because the ambient smart tech knows I'm going to need more time to work this out. I just think that's so cool. It's talking about carefully uncovering principles that I think would apply to good technology. I think one that characterizes ambient smart technology is, in general, it doesn't show up as an affordance in the environment itself. 
Mm. So this is one one thing we argue in the paper. This is kind of obvious in hindsight, but it's nice to have it kind of down explicitly is the thing about social media and when we think about hyper-stimulators and things is that what's really key there is the affordances that, 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 that they offer to the agent. And in, in technology theory, generally, we tend to think of like, oh, we, we think in terms of affordances, like what does this technology afford to the agent? I think what's really striking about ambient small environments is that they don't afford anything themselves. So it's it's the same technology as before. So it's refrigerators and cookers and exercise mm-hmm. bikes and all of this. But it's what's happening there. It's it's happening on a higher level. It's happening upstream of the agent's field of affordances. It's like this kind of like cultivating, um, overseeing, orchestrating role that's being played, which I think still needs to be properly theorized. So I think that's mm-hmm. there's going to be some future work on what exactly is the best way to understand that role. Um, but having a technology that is comfortable to fade away into the background, that's not trying to like keep your attention on it at all costs and, and, and is playing like a fundamentally very different role. Yeah, rather that's... nudging your attention to other cares and concerns rather than back to it. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Less selfish technology. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I, almost, I almost hear a company name in that 